thank you very much. Uh, this morning I'm going to talk to you about uh, some of the things that I discuss in a book that I wrote some years ago called uh, Men, Women, and Pianos, and uh, which has the subtitle A Social History. I'll explain that in a minute. Incidentally, this uh, book has come out in paperback now at a pretty reasonable price. Uh, <coughs> Why, uh, I call it a social history. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I usually start this way. <coughs> Certain great composers, Mozart, Beethoven, Chopin, Debussy, have entrusted some of their best thoughts to the piano. <coughs> uh, moreover, there have been uh, wonderful piano virtuosos, Franz Liszt, Anton Rubinstein, Rachmaninoff, other people, who have uh, <coughs> entertained and delighted and uh, <coughs> people, caused millions of people to marvel at them for their ability. Now, uh, Mozart and Beethoven, well, Debussy, and Liszt and uh, Rubinstein and Rachmaninoff, in order to do their stuff, had to have pianos, didn't they? Well, uh, where'd they get them? Well, they got them from factories. They got them from factories. But, uh, you know, factories can't very well exist by selling a few pianos to uh, a few outstanding geniuses. <coughs> you can't stay in business selling a couple of pianos to Beethoven or to Anton Rubinstein. These factories have to keep on turning out their, oh, 50, 100, 500, 5,000 pianos every year. And uh, for whom? Who wants them? Well, the answer is all kinds of people. Doctors, lawyers, merchants, chiefs, post office officials, retired, retired, <coughs> retired housewives, all kinds of people want these pianos. What do they want with them? Well, the answer to it would be then social history. The piano is uh, a potential musical instrument, we'll say. It, uh, <laughs> It is capable of producing great music, but uh, very often it does less than that. Sometimes it's entirely silent. In addition to being a potentially musical instrument, it's also a piece of household furnishing. It's, uh, shall we say, potentially musical furniture. This is how we, how we call it. <coughs> And uh, for the most part, it was acquired by people, partly by people who were uh, music lovers, who uh, enjoyed playing to, up to a point for themselves, and then even by people who uh, had no thought of uh, really playing very much. They might have uh, imagined they would have children sometime who would play, but uh, the piano got to be a kind of conventional fixture in uh, a middle-class home. It uh, was a definitely a status symbol. What kind of status? Well, it was uh, a status of prosperity, yes, up to a point, but uh, also one of cultivation. If you had a piano, that seemed to be prima facie evidence of the fact that you uh, <coughs> You had the, uh, the fine feelings, the refinement, we'll say, to appreciate that kind of music. In addition to that, it was fairly expensive. It was something that the poorer people simply could not afford, but a great many middle class people could. So, the piano then is, from the business point of view, from the social point of view, the piano is, or rather was, a piece of potentially musical furniture which, would, which functioned as a status symbol for a large number of middle-class people, middle-class families. Now, uh, assuming that the piano was played, who played it? 
Now get your minds away from Mozart and from Chopin and from uh, Rachmaninoff. Who, uh, who played this piano at home when and if it was played? Well, did, uh, did the father of the family, did the man in the uh, dry goods business, did he play the piano? Chances are he did not. <clears throat> if he was a doctor, maybe he played a little bit. But uh, generally speaking, he didn't. Uh, how about Mama? Did she play? Well, she probably had played in her youth, but the chances are that uh, housework and social engagements, that kind of thing, uh, didn't leave her much time. She didn't play too much. How about Junior? <clears throat> well, occasionally there were some juniors who were interested in playing piano, but uh, not too much. No. And the person who played was Sister, the young daughter, chiefly. Well, she might have begun taking lessons, as great many children do, all before she was 10. But uh, that would be part of her general lessons that would sort of be related to her schoolwork or something of that sort. <clears throat> But after she got out of school, between the time she got out of school and the time that she got married, there was sort of a period when, uh, well, in my childhood, they said uh, she was at home, at home. Uh, she would help Mama with some of the housework, but uh, outside of that, there was nothing much for her to do. You uh, have to now encounter two uh, patterns of thought with regard to young females that were prevalent in middle-class society, sometimes called bourgeois society. What is that, by the way? Well, it means something that's not working class. Does uh, people who don't come there and uh, carry bundles or swing hammers or press buttons for a living, and it does not mean uh, aristocrats, who live on inherited acres and spend their time with uh, fencing and uh, this kind of thing. It means uh, people who handle money. They don't work with their hands for a living, but they handle money. They are primarily merchants and professionals of the higher order. Now, these people developed uh, developed certain patterns of thought about the, about the women of their families. Uh, <clears throat> two things especially were important. The one was that a girl must not work. Why not? Well, if, uh, if a girl works for a living, if a girl goes to an office and writes other people's letters for them, or something of that kind, uh, this would seem to indicate that her father was unable to support her. It would be a reflection on her father's financial stability. Uh, a nice girl, as saying is, does not work. But not only does she not work, she mustn't seem to work. She mustn't seem to work. She must not be the kind of person who could ever consider working. She must not look as if she uh, ever indulged in any uh, muscular activity of any violence or that could possibly be dirty or messy or something like that. She was uh, an ornament to her family, perfectly dressed, neatly dressed in the kind of clothes you could not possibly work in, and with a kind of hair, hairdo that would uh, be irrevocably disturbed or destroyed by anything that resembled labor. Uh, <clears throat> the other point was that uh, a nice girl must not uh, run after, quote unquote, must not run after men. Uh, now, uh, as I point out in my book, uh, chastity is a uh, universal Christian virtue. But uh, the thing about that is that it's a little hard to prove. Uh, <laughs> people don't go shadowing, shadowing uh, young females and uh, breaking in on them in closed doors to wonder what, just what they do. 
this isn't uh, usually done. Uh, so uh, how, do you, uh, how do you assume chastity? Under what conditions? Well, it has to do with the girl's behavior. Uh, there must be, there must be a, a pretty strict decorum in the part of the girl's behavior. If, uh, if her clothes are too provocative, if uh, they expose needlessly parts of the body, if, uh, if her behavior is too aggressive, and why uh, the thought arises, oh dear, she's, she's full, forward. That word modest has a double meaning. Modest means uh, humble, not thrusting yourself forward too much. But uh, it also has the connotation of chastity. The two ideas are related. The girl must look, look dainty. That was a lovely word they used to enjoy using. Dainty and uh, not impudent. And then the presumption is in favor of her chastity. So here we are, nice girls <coughs> in middle class families, oh, for 200 years before the present, two or 300 years, in middle class families, uh, must not look as if they were working, and they must not look as uh, if they were running after men. <coughs> Now, uh, a girl doesn't work, so what does she do? Well, the point is that she engages in uh, occupations that have no ulterior purpose. No ulterior purpose. She does something, if you want to be mean about it, you say she does something useless. Uh, these, uh, <clears throat> this is proper for a nice, nice girl. Uh, now, uh, what kind of activities would that be? Well, roughly speaking, any kind of certain activities that are vaguely related to the fine arts. They had a name for this. They had a name for this throughout the centuries. It was called uh, accomplishments. Accomplishments. You don't hear this very much now, but uh, that was a very familiar word in respectable middle-class circles. What was an accomplishment? Well, uh, being able to do fancy embroidery was one, we'll say. Uh, painting, uh, painting flowers, or oh, possibly on paper, but also on vases or on china buttons. Painting roses on china buttons. This is one of my favorites. This, uh, <laughs> this was a... Uh, <laughs> This was a favorite accomplishment of young females. Uh, one that I can remember from my infancy, none of you are old enough to remember this, but there was one called wood birding. Uh, you bought a piece of wood, a plaque of wood, and a design was traced on it in black. And then uh, the girl would have a stylus, which would be heated, heated by a little alcohol uh, lamp there. And she'd take this metal stylus and trace this design, and it would burn, it would char the wood. And you'd end up with a little picture, a little landscape in charred wood. That was called wood burning, or sometimes very haughtily, pyrography. <coughs> uh, there are all kinds of things in the old days. The English literature talks about wafer work, and chenille work, and uh, I don't know the kinds of things. And of course, music was another one of these accomplishments. Uh, in general, singing, of course, was uh, perhaps the chief musical accomplishment. Singing little ditties in a pleasant and modest sort of a way that was considered quite attractive for a girl. And then, of course, playing of instruments. <coughs> now, which instrument? Here comes the question. Here is the... It's very hard to play an instrument, a musical instrument, which will uh, give the impression of 
not working very much, not working, <laughs> and uh, not uh, running after men or not acting in such a way that men will run after her too eagerly. Uh, so uh, you have a choice. The flute might give a nice feminine sound, but after all, you've got to purse your lips, huh? Well, uh, the violin. The violin was regarded for a long time as a very unwomanly instrument. You can see why. You have to contort the body like this, and then sometimes the head shakes, and what will that do to the ornaments way up on top of the bun here? And uh, then, of course, if she plays to amount to anything, plays, but she's going to get a scar on her cheek, which is unsightly. This all looks like work. So the violin is, was an unwomanly instrument. It's not until you get pretty far into the 19th century that a few, <coughs> a few brazen women decided to play violin. And the flute, as I say, she must purse her lips well. It might give uh, some people some ideas. Uh, how about a horn? Well, a horn, if you don't control your technique too much, you're going to puff the cheeks like that. And that isn't, uh, nice girls don't do that. <coughs> Not in living rooms, anyhow. How about a cello? Ooh! <laughs> well. <coughs> I think you see the point. Uh, now, with all these instruments ruled out, what remains? Well, obviously the keyboard. So, the girl can sit there at the keyboard and not move in any way to disturb either her dress or her hairdo, her feet nicely together, and her hands gently touching the keys. And she can smile a very pleasant, decorous smile, and still play a little accompaniment to her own voice, singing a song about springtime or something of that kind. And uh, really, when you think it over, that that image, that picture, was the basis of the piano business for a century and a half. Oh, more than that, if you want to include the harpsichord, too. For several centuries. <coughs> so, <coughs> the keyboard instruments have been associated with the young, feminine part of the population for a long, long time. Uh, let's have a look at it. Let's have a look at it. Uh, would you put on the first picture, please? First slide. Hmm? Well, uh, this is a well-known collection of pieces for the harpsichord. In fact, this is the first, uh, <coughs> the first collection ever printed, and it says so. Parthenia, or the maidenhead of music, of the first music, that ever was printed for the virginals. Now, look, that name virginal. That was <coughs> an instrument that we call a harpsichord. It was a small one called virginals because it was expected to be played by girls. Incidentally, it's in the plural. Don't let that bother you. That's just a, a plural, a plural word, but it's a, a singular idea. It's like saying stairs. Stairs is plural, but it's one thing. And I think the analogy of stairs c came from the keys here. They, they looked a little like, like stairs. There were many keys, so the thing was called virginals. <coughs> the Maidenhead of Music, first, first music that was ever printed for the virginals, composed by three famous masters, William Byrd, Dr. John Bull, and Orlando Gibbons, gentlemen of His Majesty's most illustrious chapel, dedicated Oh, I don't know, something. The Lovers of Music engraven by William Ball for Dorothy Evans. Now, uh, this uh, piece of printing was a gift. It was a gift to Princess Elizabeth, not Queen Elizabeth, Princess Elizabeth, the daughter of James I, on the occasion of her marriage to a German prince. And the, the thing was presented probably by this Lady Dorothy Evans, who was probably one of the princess's ladies in waiting. Parthenia. 
That word Parthenia comes from the Greek Parthenos, which means a young woman, a girl, a virgin. Well, Parthenia, it's number one, or Maidenhead, number two, of the first music ever printed for virginals, number three. Then uh, Dorothy Evans is number four, and the girl herself pictured there, that's number five. As I say in my book, here's a five-barrel charge of girlishness fired off, <laughs> the first appearance of this instrument in print. <laughs> you can see it was intended for girls, and the girls are all over the frontispiece. Uh, the, uh, you might interest you to take a look at that picture, look at the hands of the, of the girl. This is correct for the period. The keys of the old harpsichords were shorter than our keys, especially the lower keys. We call them white keys, except they were mostly black in those days. And in such a way that the thumb was not much used. So if you wanted to play a scale going up, an ascending scale, you would have to <clears throat> put the longer fingers over the shorter, and the position of the hands would be pointing outward. This would be normal that way. <clears throat> All right, let's have the next uh, slide then. Uh, this is a Dutch picture, Dutch painting, from the late 17th century. Incidentally, Parthenia came out about 1611. This is uh, later in the century and uh, was painted by a, well, a minor Dutch painter, Ochterfeld is his name. And uh, the point about these Dutch painters was they were very skillful with their brushes and mixing of colors, but uh, what did they paint and what were they paid to paint? Well, they painted domestic interiors for the most part. Some of these uh, Dutchmen got rich uh, selling coffee, importing coffee from Asia or, or something else, chocolate from America, I don't know. And then they bought themselves nice things for their houses and then they hired painters to paint their interiors. That was also kind of a status symbol. So, this is a painting of a Dutch interior. There are various articles of luxury there, including pet dogs. And actually, I think the main part of this painting is the dress, the girl's dress. It's a beautiful cerise color. I have a colored reproduction of it in my studio. The thing of interest for us now is that she is playing that little harpsichord, that little virginal there, standing up, standing up. This was quite common in those days. There were no pedals on those instruments. There was no particular occasion to use the feet for anything except just to stand. And the instruments were often very small. There were boxes that could be hauled and put on any convenient surface. And so they were played standing up like that, and there you are. <coughs> Incidentally, just to get the nomenclature clear, uh, virginals, harpsichord, spinet are all synonymous. They are all keyboard instruments, predecessors of the piano, not ancestors, but predecessors of the piano, uh, all operating by jacks and quills. The keys were depressed, sent up a jack up this way, which had a quill in it, a bird's quill, very often, later on leather quills, which plucked the string on the way up and then came down gently and got back under the string again. Uh, in other words, plucked string instruments, virginal, harpsichord, spinet, they're all synonymous. And in Italian, cembalo means the same thing. In French, clavecin, clavecin. All right, let's have another, another slide. Huh. Here we have uh, a painting by a man, a Dutch painter again, who was uh, a little bit more interested in human nature than he was in house furnishings. This is a lesson. And anybody that has ever taught music will develop some sympathy for this picture. <laughs> there's, uh, there's a girl, and I don't think anybody looking at her would uh, 
think she was very bright. Uh, all right, next. Ha! Huh. Well, as I said, the harpsichord virginal spinet was the predecessor of the piano. Its purpose, its social purpose, was pretty much the same as that of the piano. For them, uh, originally, the harpsichords were in the homes of the ar aristocracy. But then, uh, little by little, a bourgeoisie developed, moneyed people who had no title and no rank, who then imitated the habits of the aristocracy. And uh, then, at a certain period, we begin to see, uh, begin to see in indications that the harpsichord would be supplanted by a different kind of an instrument. And uh, working on a different principle, that is, played on keys, but producing sound on, on a different principle. And this, of course, was the piano, which does not pluck strings, but strikes them by means of hammers. The true ancestor of the piano is the dulcimer. Look out now that you uh, don't think about uh, dulcimers in West Virginia when you use that word. That, they, that is a corrupt use of the word, the one they had down there. The dulcimer was a stringed instrument. Strings are all st stretched in, <coughs> in uh, fixed pitch tuning, played by hammers held in the fist, like this. The various other names for the dulcimer, the Germans sometimes gave it a mean name. They called it a hacking board, sausage board, <laughs> for making, making mincemeat. Hackbrett, you'll see. And uh, then the uh, Hungarian gypsies have a name for it. They call it cymbalum, cymbalum. And uh, it's, uh, well, it uh, is still in vogue among Hungarian gypsies. There are quite a few of them in Cleveland and other cities where there are Hungarian settlements. <laughs> now the piano is a dulcimer or a cymbalum with keys, where instead of one hammer in each fist, you have a great many little hammers operated by keys and levers. This is the title page of a literary magazine that came out in Italy, Giornale dei Letterati d'Italia. Volume 5 of Domo Quinta, Journal of the Liter Literate People, Let Literati of Italy, in the year 1711, you see, under the protection of the Serene Highness, the Prince of Tuscany. Does anybody know what family the Princes of Tuscany were? Anybody tell me? Well, the Princes of Tuscany were the famous Medici family, Medici, who had been patrons of art for centuries before that. In Venice, 1711, and so forth, and even on below, under the protection also of, let's see, something, uh, Serene Highness or something, Pope Clement XI. Now, this is the title page of the magazine. Now, will you have the next slide, and we will see one of the essays, one of the, one of the articles in it. Ha ha. Now, just pitch yourselves if you teach piano or play piano. This is it. This is the beginning of the instrument called the piano. Article 9, it says, Nuova invenzione d'un gravi cembalo called piano e forte. <laughs> Aggiunte alcune considerazioni sopra gli strumenti musicali. New invention of a clavicembalo, that is to say a keyboard, with the piano and forte. This is the first mention in the history of the world of the words piano forte like this, to indicate an instrument. New invention, and added several considerations on musical instruments. This article was written by a uh, scholar named Maffei, Scipione Maffei, and it is a description of an instrument made by Cristofori, who all our books tell us is the inventor of the pianoforte. In other words, a keyed, a keyed cymbalum or keyed dulcimer. So uh, there you are. If the <coughs> price of inventions be measured by their novelty and by the difficulty in which uh, they 
well, which it, the, the difficulty it is uh, that has come up in making them or inventing it is something is well. You see, I can't translate that right now. He's about to describe something which uh, is worthy of great praise. Great praise because of the <laughs> difficulty that had to be overcome in inventing it. In novelty. That it is not known to everybody who enjoys music that one of the principal sources, uh, one of the principal fountains of pleasure from which the experts in this art have, can get the secret of unusually de delighting their listeners is the piano and the forte, either in the announcements or answers or some forth various. At any rate, this is a, this is a, a rather a, elaborate introduction to say that shading, loud and soft, is one of the principal pleasures of music. And he describes the invention of this instrument whereby loudness and softness can be obtained by pressure of the finger, not by any mechanical device. And he mentions the person who, uh, who first invented it. On the second page you say, Signor Bartolomeo Cristofali. It's amusing to think that in this first piece about the piano, the inventor's name should have been misspelled or misread. He calls him Cristofali. We know his name is Cristofori but uh, just a little linguistic sloppiness. Well, this, uh, the point was that the Prince of Tuscany, I think Ferdinand de' Medici, had purchased this instrument for his collection. And uh, it may still exist. At least another instrument, instrument made by Cristofori back in the early part of the 18th century does exist at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. It was put in order and was played once publicly, I don't think with any great success. All right, let's have the next slide. Here we have the title page of the first music ever published, music which mentions the piano. This says in 1732. <clears throat> and give you an idea of uh, Europe and the frame of mind of European society. Just look at it. Sonatas da cimbalo di piano e forte, detto volgarmente di martelletti. Sonatas for the keyboard of the piano and forte, in other words, for piano forte, commonly, commonly called with hammers. And now look at the, look at the typography dedicated to His Royal Highness. Look at the size of that lettering. His Royal Highness, the most serene Don Antonio Infante of Portugal. And composed by Ludovico Giustini di Pistoia. There's the composer. Opus 1, Florence, in the year 1732. But look at the way that prince, who may have been a nincompoop as far as we're concerned, <laughs> Look at the way his name is put out there, and this very humble composer. His Royal Highness, the Serene Don Antonio in Infant, Inf yes, Infanta of Portugal, and composed by Ludovico Giustini, like this. See? I would say this is a good picture of Europe, at least in the 18th century. Next. Here's some of the music. And uh, there is one point there that proves that it's for piano. This is not bad, this music is not remarkable. Just run of the mind music of the early 18th century. How does it go? And so forth. Now you notice several indications there of piano and forte. In the line two, you have piano, and, and then two bars later comes forte. Well, this doesn't prove that it's for a piano, because it could have been for a uh, harpsichord with several ranks of strings, you understand. You can pull out stops on a harpsichord, which will bring in more strings into play, and you can play louder in one stop than can in another. So the piano in forte does not prove this. But at the end of the line, you will see the words più piano. Pio piano, more piano. Now, this is impossible on a harpsichord. 
You either pull out the stop or you don't pull it out. But if you have pew piano, more piano, this is evidently something that can only be done with the fingers. And this is the absolute proof that this is piano music. The end of line two and the beginning of the last line, the, the incomplete <coughs> last line there. Piano and pew piano. So he wants you to play softly over there and then the repetition is softer. <laughs> for the last bar. Incidentally, uh, these few little indications, shading, might be an interesting source of uh, uh, understanding of per performance practice in those years. Notice the, the forte ending, suddenly forte ending there. Anyhow, this is the first music for the piano, expressly called for the piano, ever to have been printed composer Giustini. <clears throat> All right, next. Well, we have to get on. There was another instrument, another keyboard instrument, besides the harpsichord and the piano, a very old and very simple instrument known as the clavichord. I don't know if any of you have ever played a clavichord, You've probably seen one. The clavichord also was a keyboard instrument. It did not pluck strings. It did not hit the strings with hammers. It hit the strings with a very simple device known as a tangent. A tangent is just a little piece of horizontal piece of metal at the end of a, of a lever, like that. You'd have your key here, wooden key, and at the end of the key was an upright piece of metal and then a horizontal piece which would then strike the string this way from the broad side. Now, it didn't only strike the string. Uh, it also made the pitch. Also made the pitch. Uh, <coughs> the thing about the hammer instrument, the piano, is that the hammer hits the string and jumps right back. <coughs> So your complete string vibrates. But the clavichord tangent doesn't jump back. It has no such complex mechanism. It just hits the string and stays on it. Well, if it stays on it, of course, it makes a pitch. If, if you have a string this long and you hit it right here, you'll have really two pitches. You'll have the longer segment and the shorter segment. <laughs> now, it makes the pitch, yes. But it also kills it, makes the tone, but kills it at the same moment. After all, this thing squashes the string, and you get a rather poor quality of sound. Have you ever seen a violinist uh, not use a bow, have his bow at the side, and hit the strings like this? You've, you've seen that. Well, that's about how a clavichord works. He can play a tune with his left hand there by making pitch, making pitch there just with his fingers. But he wouldn't pretend that that was a good quality of sound. Well, the clavichord was like that. And uh, I said uh, before that uh, the tangent would make two pitches. It would uh, have the longer segment and the shorter segment, yes. But the shorter segment would be silenced, usually, in well-made clavichords by having cloth damp it all the way through. If you see a clavichord, you'll always see one end with cloth woven in and out of the strings. Well, the clavichord had a certain vogue at a certain time. It was uh, generally regarded as a pretty poor instrument, which indeed it is. Which indeed it is. It's, uh, it makes very little sound. If I tried to play a clavichord on this stage here now to you, I think perhaps only a few of you in the front rows could hear it at all. It's, it's, it's a very faint sounding thing. And of course, it's very simply made. But the place where it was in great vogue was in Germany. In Germany, from the middle of the 18th century on. For two reasons. First of all, it was so simple that it was cheap. You could get a clavichord, say, for 15 or 20 dollars, where a good harpsichord would cost 150. So a great many poorer people who still had a certain sense of respectability, who did not consider themselves working class people, 
Oh, school teachers, ministers, uh, smaller officials, say, post office officials. This was a, a good instrument for people of that kind, of that, on that level, to buy. Then the other great advantage was that, with all its poor quality of tone, the clavichord was stroke responsive, stroke responsive. Actually, if you hit it louder, if you hit it harder, it would sound louder, and if you hit it more gently, it would be very gentle. The way I usually describe it is that the clavichord had quite a range of shading, quite a range of shading, sensitive range between double piano and triple piano, to put it that way. Well, we get on in the 18th century, we find that especially the Germans uh, work up a great uh, ideology of sentimentalism, Empfindsamkeit, they used to call it. We suddenly, well, not suddenly, but actually this was the result of a religious movement known as pietism. Uh, people who were very religious by nature, but uh, were made unhappy by the formal theology and the formal church practice of the Lutheran church. And they said, oh, all this Latin quotation, all this arguing about points in the Bible, all this means nothing. The only thing that's important is how you feel, how you feel toward the sacred objects, the Almighty, the Savior, and so forth. So we find that, especially in Germany and in some other countries, we get a cult of feeling. The important thing is emotion. The greatest thing you can do is to be moved. And how does anybody know you're moved? Well, you do something, chiefly you weep. You might say, you might say that uh, for the pietists and their descendants of the late 18th century, uh, the greatest thing in the world was to show the evidence of emotion. Now, what's the greatest evidence of feeling that you can, that you can show? What's the very greatest, the absolute one, beyond which you can do no more? Well, it's to drop dead. Uh, somebody says something, some, or you experience something, and it's so terrible or so wonderful you feel so much that you just can't support it anymore. You die. This happens in uh, books and plays and poems. Oh yes, oh yes, this, uh, the people love to contemplate this. The only thing is that, uh, uh, you know, it's nice work if you can get it, but uh, uh, a lot of people can't make it. What's the, uh, <laughs> what's, the second, what's the second most glorious thing to do? If you can't quite drop dead, then what can you do? Faint, right, you are right. You fall in a faint, you lose consciousness. And this can be done. This is more likely to happen. Not only that, but it can be faked, you see. If it's such an accomplishment, well then people will pretend to it even if it isn't real. Now you can't very well pretend to be dead because somebody's gonna come there and feel your heartbeat. But you can pretend to faint. But if you can't faint, or if it's unbecoming at the moment, if, if it's not the right place to faint, then what can you do? You can weep, you can burst into tears. And so this was the third in the order of accomplishments. Uh, <clears throat> this cult of feeling of excessive emotion, this went on for quite some time. It covered a good many other countries besides Germany. Uh, the sentimentalism, oh, I'd say three quarters of a century perhaps when uh, you couldn't read a story or a poem in which somebody didn't die. Uh, I can remember as a child reading Little Women by Louisa Alcott. And there are four girls in there. And uh, I was smart enough to understand that out of those four girls, one of them has simply got to die. Uh, why? Well, it's just to squeeze a few tears out of the reader. Readers would have been cheated if somebody hadn't died because then they couldn't weep. Now, the clavichord was a good instrument for letting people have a chance to weep to themselves. The general picture is of uh, 
uh, somebody shutting himself or herself up in a small room when the noise of the day is done and playing some strains and then bursting into tears. Well, I don't know if that's a nice way to spend Sunday or not, but uh, <laughs> evidently some people thought so. So, we begin to get poems addressed to the clavier. The word clavier, in this case, means clavichord. That was the instrument most in use in that time of the 18th century in Germany. And a great many poems were written, addressed apostrophes to the clavier, to the clavichord. So here you are. Bereitet mich zum Schlummer, sanft klagendes Klavier. Ermüdet durch den Kummer, komm ich betrübt zu dir. Dir sing ich meine Klagen. Vermindere du die Plagen und du gebeugtes Herz. Vergiss nun deinen Schmerz. Vergiss nun deinen Schmerz. Well, it rhymes nicely. Prepare me for my slumber, gently plaintive Klavier. Tired out through sorrow, I come saddened to you. To you I sing my complaints. <clears throat> you abate my tortures, my pains, plaga, and you bowed heart. Forget your pain, forget your pain. Now, this music was composed by Johann Adam Hiller, who was a gifted musician and who uh, made quite a reputation with light operas. And he got out a music magazine, almost the first one devoted to music, about six, 1767. And he prints this piece, which is a clavichord piece. Look several things about it. You notice that the right hand is in the soprano clef, not in the G clef, not in the treble clef. This was customary in Germany. You notice that the Italian piece I showed you before, the sonata from 1732, did have the right hand in the treble clef, in the G clef. Uh, the Italians had done this, but the Germans still stuck to the soprano clef, and all of Sebastian Bach's music is written with the right hand in the soprano clef. You notice also that although this is a song, which is supposed to be sung, the thing is printed on only two staffs. What does that mean? Well, who would sing it? Oh, some lovesick girl, or some, maybe some poor elderly man with an ailment, uh, and uh, amateurs, and they just uh, could not be trusted could not be trusted to sing one line and play another. This, this is a little beyond the simple capacities of these people. So you have this thing played on the keyboard so that the fellow singing it, or the girl singing it, would not fly off the pitch. Now this happens to be a rather nice little piece.
It's, uh, might have been composed by somebody like uh, Philip Emanuel Bach, like one of Bach's sons or something like that. Hmm. So we get this cult of the clavichord. And the main thing is that its capacity for shading, capacity especially for diminuendo, was something that was likely to arouse tears, likely to arouse tears. It was an instrument for people who like to go off with the instrument in a small room, I don't know what kind of a room, a clothing closet or bathroom or something, and have a good cry. <laughs> Next, please. Here's another original document. This is a very interesting one. Finally, after about 50 years or 60 years of existence, the piano became improved. And uh, also, well, piano became improved, and finally the thing was performed, played in public before a large audience. Had to wait quite a time. This is a opera performance or musical comedy performance at Covent Garden in London. <coughs> the partic uh, for the benefit of Miss Brickler, evidently she was a star, and benefit means that on that one evening she got all the take. She just wasn't on her salary. This is what they used to call it. This is the Beggar's Opera, famous uh, light opera. Captain McKeith, and there's the court, there's the cast, Mr. Shooter, Mr. Dunstall, and so forth. Holly by Miss Brickler, that's the feminine lead. Now look at the fine print under there. End of Act One. Miss Brickler will sing a favorite song from Judith, accompanied by Mr. Dibden on a new instrument called Piano Forte. There's it, 16th of May, 1767. This is the, the beginning, the origin of all public piano playing. I say all public. This is the first one of which we have any record and the first one in which it took place on a grand scale. It's quite possible that there were some public or semi-public performances on a small scale of a piano in Germany before this. After 1770, after 1760, the piano began to replace the harpsichord very quickly. And of course, harpsichords, being constructed primarily for ladies and gentlemen, were also works of art in themselves. They had beautiful paintings on the lid and uh, <coughs> all sorts of uh, inlay work. So there was some, some effort, not much, also, making pianos pretty, making them pretty to look at. All this is uh, simply one of the few examples of a piano uh, designed by one of the famous furniture makers. You have Chippendale and Adam and Sheraton. I believe this is a piano designed by Sheraton. And it was done for a Spanish prince who wanted to present it to his liege lady, the Queen of Spain. And uh, this is the plan for it. <clears throat> you notice that uh, the piano has no pedals. Now, by this time, pianos were made with pedals. But uh, Mr. Sheraton thought that that spoiled the line, you understand? He just didn't believe in pedals didn't look nice, see? Look nice, I love that word. Uh, I hear it all the time. Uh, so he left them off. But pedals were added to this instrument later on, I think, by somebody who really wanted to play it. I believe this instrument is now in this country. It may be in this neighborhood, too. I used to know who the owner was and so forth. I think he was a relative of a friend of mine. All right, next. Ha ha. Now, uh, the piano, the natural shape of a piano, of course, it's got the long strings on the one side and the shorter ones on the other. So the piano normally has a wing shape, so does the harpsichord. Any of these string keyboard instruments would have, would have that. But uh, <clears throat> some need was felt for altering the shape to suit the demands of interior decorators and ladies with space distribution problems. So uh, <coughs> you begin to get tips to uh, take a piano further up in the air and take up less room on the ground. 
So they devised something called an upright grand. An upright grand is, is exactly what the words say. If you take this piano, and instead of having it horizontal, would just lift it up like that, so that that tail end was up in the air, you'd have an upright grand. Now, maybe some people thought that the wing shape, when it was upright, didn't look nice. So the thing was eked out, was added to so that it would have a rectangular shape on top. And then the whole thing covered over with some elegant cloth, silk or something. And this upright grand was in vogue for the earlier decades of the 19th century. This uh, is, I think, an advertisement for a New York uh, piano, uh, piano dealer. Was it Du Bois? Yes. Yes. New York, something by W. Du Bois in his Piano Forte and Music Store on 126 Broadway. And uh, this gives you a good picture of uh, the piano at home, piano fulfilling its primary function of being a decorous entertainment and accomplishment for young ladies. Look at the expression on her face. It's quite angelic, very decorous. And look at her gown. Uh, this also dates it. This is a style, isn't it, that is called empire, high waist, like that. That would place it, oh, say, 1815, 1820, something like that. There's your upright grand with the silk and so forth. And look at the expression of her hands, nice and quiet and decorous. She uh, isn't, is not even passing under the thumb. She just does not have to work. <laughs> Next. Next. Now here's another kind of upright grand. Shows the shape more. This kind was called a giraffe. You can see why. And this was quite in vogue in Vienna. And, uh, well, there's nothing much to say about it. You have a Greek column, an Ionian column there at the left, which uh, pretends to support that scroll up on top. The interesting thing is below. You'll notice there are about five or six petals below there. Now, uh, what, what, what do you need five or six petals for? Really, two are plenty. One to just take the dampers off the strings, and uh, another one maybe to make things a little softer. <clears throat> well, they, there was quite a vogue in the end of the 18th century and early 19th for what was called Turkish music. What was that? Well, <clears throat> the Turks uh, had overrun a good part of Europe in the 16th, 17th centuries, and uh, sedate, pious Christian Westerners were very much impressed with the, uh, with the Turkish military bands, which consisted largely of percussion things like cymbals and drums of some kind and rattlers and noisemakers generally. <clears throat> and after the Turks were kept quiet and driven out mostly and not a danger anymore, why uh, some of their stuff became fashionable. You found that Western princes, dukes and kings, used to uh, have Turkish bands just for the fun of it. And uh, then when you get a piano, why uh, some attempt was made to be able to make Turkish music right on a piano. So these pe pedals operated percussion instruments. <coughs> bass drum, cymbals, triangle, uh, something they called a bassoon. I don't know what that could have been. You have these Turkish marches, especially by Austrian composers, by Mozart and by Beethoven, you know. <laughs> That's nothing, that's mild, that's only, that's only music. Just think of that with a bunch of percussion instruments. <laughs> well, that's how it was intended. Mozart writes these arpeggios, and that's what he means, Rup, the drum. And so forth. And the last page, you have the rattlers. But 
how much more fun would it be if instead of playing D and C sharp there, you just had some made a noise, get, 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 like that. And that's what those pedals were for. This was a fleeting vogue, and, uh, but it is represented there. It is represented. Someday somebody's going to put one of those in order and give me a chance to play Mozart or maybe Beethoven, maybe trum pum 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 on that. All right, next, please. Here's a nice landmark. This is a letter of Beethoven. Now, we're now getting on in the 19th century, about 1816 or 17. And uh, <clears throat> Beethoven was generally recognized to be the world's leading musician, leading composer. There are a lot of people who did not enjoy his music, but still, uh, he was the great man. <clears throat> and so there was the English piano firm of Broadwood, which decided to give him a piano. Was that just the goodness of their hearts? Was that uh, really love of one's neighbor that they wanted to give him a piano? Well, maybe a little of that. But actually, this was a piece of advertising, propaganda. <clears throat> for generations, for a century. I, was, I heard English people say, oh yes, Broadwoods, they made a piano for Beethoven. So uh, they made him a piano, or made one, gave him one. And this is his letter of thanks. Uh, <clears throat> I might tell you that although the piano started in Italy, the Italians soon lost interest in it, and the Germans took over. And for the good part of the 18th century, the Germans, uh, well, they made quite a few improvements on it, especially in Vienna and Austria. They had a <coughs> special kind of action, which was pretty good, pretty light. But uh, as the 18th century drew to a close, the really leading piano makers were the English. The English, they devised a better action than <coughs> the Germans had, and their pianos had more sonority, and they made <coughs> pianos of a greater range than the Germans did or the Austrians did. So, <clears throat> when Broadwoods presented this piano to Beethoven, he was delighted. It was a piano, pianos previously had been about five octaves. Mozart's piano went from F to F. This is Mozart's piano. <clears throat> See? 60, let me see, 64 notes I think is all he had, or 62 notes. <clears throat> The Broadwood piano that Beethoven received, I think, had a range of six and one quarter octaves. It went from here 